now we want to get a hold of this effect of twisting out of the plane. And for that, we'll introduce a third vector. We want to complete this vector to a basis in three dimensions. We have two vectors that form an orthonormal basis for the plane that they're in, the osculating plane. Right? But we want to complete it to a basis in the space. And so we'll add a vector q that's orthogonal to both t and p and points in the direction such that the triplet t, p, and q is positively oriented. Meaning that if t points in this direction and p points in this direction, you will, you will use your right hand and curve your fingers from t to p. And whichever way your thumb points, that's where q is directed. So q would be directed this way. That would be the triplet. Q is called the binormal, because think about it, if this is the, tan the unit tangent vector, right, because it is orthogonal to it, it also points in the direction normal to the curve. Now this might be the principal normal direction, but this is another normal direction, just because it's in that orthogonal plane. You guys are with me on that? So that's why the word normal figures in the, in the name, and it's called the binormal, which is the second normal. Does that make sense? So that's Q. Okay. So that defines these three quantities, and I'll just write the name. It's called the Frenet frame. Well, I'll just write it here. The Frenet frame or the Frenet basis. Okay, but just defining this quantity, Q, this vector Q, doesn't tell us about the rate in which the curve is twisting out of its instantaneous plane. So we'd like to measure that. So we're going to do the one thing that we can, and that's take the derivative of p, right? Uh, p is a function of s, so in this identity here, everything is a function of the arc length. b, by virtue of this definition, is a function of the arc length, and then you split it into a scalar and a unit vector. So of course the scalar is a function of the arc length, and p is a function of the arc length. So what we want to know is the derivative of p with respect to s. And our goal right now, we don't know where it, where it will lead us, but that is to look at the derivative of the principal normal with respect to s, the arc length. Why are we doing this? To be quite frank, it's the only operation that we have at our disposal. That's why we're really doing it. Uh, quite a bit of my research is guided by the question of not uh, what should I do and not what's the right thing to do here, but what can I do? And I just do what I can and see where it takes me. So we're going to do the one thing we can and see where it takes us. Now, on the one hand, there is not much that we can do here because we don't have an expression for p, we don't have anything specific. So what we're hoping is that some nice relationship will emerge. And all we know for now is that this is just some vector. And if it's some vector, then we can decompose it with respect to this basis. So let's do it and see if we can determine the coefficients. So what's the best we can do right now? We can imagine that this derivative that we're interested in is a linear combination of these three vectors because any vector at that point is a linear combination of these three vectors because this is a very nice basis. It's orthonormal. So in general, it will be how we're going to determine the coefficients. Well, we have the dot product at our disposal. And as we learned a couple lectures ago, the dot product is one of the more algebraic and efficient ways of discovering the coefficients. It has two advantages. Number one, uh, we can get each coefficient one at a time. That's a great benefit. That's when the basis is orthonormal, which it is. And, uh, well, actually, that's the one big advantage. I think the two that I had in mind were both one and the same, having to do with the fact that this is an orthonormal basis. 
And the way you do it is by dotting the vector with each of the basis vectors. Now, the one thing we know is that because P is a unit length vector, so in other words, it's a constant length vector, its derivative will be orthogonal to P, so uh, beta will be zero. So we already know that, but I think I'll repeat the logic anyway, just to see what happens if maybe you forget, uh, or maybe you jump to a conclusion too soon. So you want it to come out in a way that's natural or automatic and algorithmic. So that's what we're going to do. So first we're going to go after alpha. And alpha, as you know, is the dot product of the vector that we're decomposing and the tangent vector. And my next step is one of my favorite steps. It's an application of the product rule, but it's an application of the product rule in reverse. We can write the product of this derivative and the vector itself in the following way. It's the derivative of their product. Okay, so sometimes this is a little bit confusing. So let me show, show you very quickly where it comes from. The product rule le reads that the derivative of fg is the derivative of f times g plus f times the derivative of g. But what I can do is uh, subtract fg prime from both sides and I'll discover that f prime g is fg prime minus fg prime, fg quantity prime minus fg prime. It was a false thing that they had invented in school so that the children who have to study algebra can all pass it. They had invented a set of rules which if you followed them without thinking could produce the answer. Subtract seven from both sides. If you have a multiplier, divide both sides by the multiplier and so on. A series of steps by which you could get the answer if you didn't understand what you were trying to do. So it's completely obvious and, it and I would still call it the product rule. Two interesting things I can tell you about this is that when in applications to integration, this is called integration by parts, which I find a little bit unfortunate because it makes it sound like a new thing, but it's not a new thing. It's just uh, an application of the product rule. That's all it is. That's one thing that I wanted to mention. And another thing that I wanted to mention is that I think of this operation tactically as moving the derivative from f to g. Do you see that you can see it this way? Like if you're working with something, like for example, your, that's actually why it finds applications in integration. Well, not surprising, it's a fundamental fact. Uh, so if you're working with something like this, and you say to yourself, for the purposes of my problem, I really wish that the derivative was on g and not on f. Well, this allows you to do that. Does that make sense? I can think of it as moving my derivative from f to g at the expense of having this additional term. Okay, so let's see what this gives us. Well, we know that p is orthogonal to t at every point. So this is identically zero for every value of s. Ah, so this term is zero. And t sub s, the derivative of the unit tangent with respect to the arc length is right here, right? It's the curvature normal. In other words, it's the curvature times the principal normal. So we write this as minus sigma uh, p dotted with p. And what is p dot p? One, because p is unit length, that's right. So minus sigma, so we've determined that alpha equals uh, minus sigma. Isn't that nice? Okay, so we've determined one coefficient. So this coefficient is actually very intuitive. I'll just show it to you here. So imagine that we just have a planar curve. So if you think about how t changes, let me grab another vector. So if you think about how t changes, 
Well, the way t changes, it changes because it's a unit vector that changes its direction. And so the result becomes the unit, a unit normal for the principal normal pointing in this direction. Okay, great. And so as it's twisting, it's, it's changing. But of course, uh, the rate, that's where the curvature comes from. But think about how the principal normal changes. So if we think of, if I just take the unit tangent and put all of them at the same point, we'll just notice that it curves, right? And that's why it has a non-zero derivative. But the principal normal stays orthogonal to it, so they curve together, right? And so whatever the rate at which the unit tangent curves, that's the same rate at which the principal normal curves, right? It's just that its derivative will point, need a third one, in that direction, right? At the 90 degrees, at the 90 degree angle in the counterclockwise direction. What I'm trying to say is that the rates of change of t and p are the same. And the minus sign is because the derivative of the principal normal will point in the direction opposite to the tangent. So it's very nice how it worked out as simply as it possibly could, but it also makes total sense if we just imagine them rotating together. Okay, so that's alpha. So we now know alpha. Let's now do beta. Uh, we already know the answer. It will be zero, but let's just see it happen. And to get beta, of course, we need to dot both sides with P. So we have that beta, okay, by our decomposition by the dot product. But because P is constant length, its derivative is orthogonal to it, so this equals zero. So that's all there is to it, okay? So beta equals zero. And so now we come to gamma. Gamma is interesting because with gamma we won't be able to do anything. And you would think it's a negative, but it's actually a positive. So what, what is gamma? Gamma is, and there's nothing we can do here uh, just because if we use the same trick and move the derivative from P to Q, well, we don't know much about the derivative of Q, right? So this wouldn't lead to anything. But now let's think. We're going to turn this into a positive, and it'll be in the exact same way as we did with curvature, with defining curvature. <clears throat> Why would this not be zero? Why would the derivative of the principal normal uh, not just lie in the plane, in the osculating plane? Well, let's think about that. So if the curve was lying direct, was lying in the plane, let me put it this way. So if the curve was a planar curve, then the tangent lies in this plane, and then the principal normal will lie entirely in this plane, like this, okay? And so its derivative will be entirely in this plane, and it'll be orthogonal uh, to t, excuse me, to p. In other words, it'll point in the direction opposite of t, okay? And in which case, these two terms will give the full decomposition, and we wouldn't need anything orthogonal to the plane. Right? So the reason why there is a third component is because the curve is not planar. Or rather, there would be a third component only when the curve is not planar, but when it twists out of the plane. And the more it twists out of the plane, the greater that component will be. So we'll once again turn things on their head and say that gamma, it, whatever it ends up being for any particular curve, is the measure of the rate at which the curve twists out of its osculating plane. Does that make sense? And the letter that's used for it is tau. The term that's used for it is torsion. torsion. And this is the definition of torsion. Once again, we start with our intuition and turn that into the definition. So it becomes kind of a primary notion. So what we have is that P, the derivative of the principal normal, is minus minus sigma t plus tau q. Okay, great. Let, Let me, me summarize it. It became a very elegant expression. 
I'm enjoying this very much, just the, how co compact and elegant it is, right? And I just want to remind you that this is the consequence of our definitions and a very nice consequence. And at the same time, tau, this is the definition of tau. So tau can, can be, be defined, defined as this product. So this is not a property like the previous derivation, but the definition of tau. Does that make sense? Okay, so that's torsion. Okay, great. So we've actually given all of the characteristics of the curves. We got the unit tangent, the curvature normal, curvature, its magnitude, the principal normal, its direction, the binormal, a vector orthogonal to both the tangent and the principal normal, and now torsion. So we've got everything. What else is there left to do? Well, what else? I'll tell you what else there is left to do, and that is to satisfy our curiosity and try to answer what Q sub S is. And why would we ask a question like this? And the answer is because we can. And we're continuing to do what we can. So let's discover what this is, and it will actually be a very fun calculation similar to this one. Mm -hmm.